The Denver Broncos taking a quarterback 12th overall in the 2024 NFL Draft would not be a reach. We'll explain why on today's brand new episode, Locked on Broncos. You are Locked on Broncos, your daily Denver Broncos podcast. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. What's happening, Broncos country? Welcome here to a brand new episode of Lockdown Broncos, your daily Denver Broncos podcast, part of the Lockdown Podcast Network, your team every day. Thank you so much to all the everydayers out there in Broncos country for tuning in, making us your first listen of the day every single day. You can get this podcast for free on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts. So make sure you do us a favor, hit that subscribe or that follow button so you never miss out on what's going on with your favorite team every single day all year long because for the true fan there's never an off season i'm cody rourke broncos reporter for mile high sports joined alongside as always by sarah benninger site expert predominantly orange.com we're in that time of the year where there's a lot of conversations going on as the nfl draft the buildup begins we've seen it even through nfl free agency where a lot of conversation and discourse on what the broncos should or shouldn't do with the 12th overall pick in the 2024 nfl draft and one of the ones that I have seen that just kind of, it makes me a little frustrated. It makes me kind of scratch my chin and say, what are, like, where are we getting this from? I see a lot of comments. I see a lot of discussion amongst the fan base. I feel like it's split 50-50 that if the Broncos take a quarterback at 12th overall, they're reaching. How do we get to this point, Sarah? And, and what does it really mean? Like, What determines that it's a reach? Because I feel like this is a conversation I'm seeing so much groupthink surrounding on my Instagram. I'm seeing it on Twitter. I'm seeing it on threads. And to me, I'm trying to figure out where did it originate. Right. This is the danger of basing your opinion based off the opinions of others, right? That's a it's a tough thing. And I know that some people have obviously gone through and, you know, studied some of these quarterbacks, watch a few of their games and see what they like, see what they dislike. And there are people out there, Cody, who have formulated their own certain levels and tiers and boards. And they say, Well, I look at this guy, I don't see an NFL franchise quarterback. So to the credit of those that have done the research out there. I mean, you can say whatever you want, but if you're just going based off of, hey, the mock draft simulators that I'm using are saying the Broncos should, they they may get J.J. McCarthy, they may get Bo Nix or Michael Penix, but those guys are like, you know, 20th to 40th on the big boards. And it's like, well, well, whose big board is it, right? Because that's the dangerous territory that we get into. And I, I often joke around with you, Cody, about the 2020 NFL draft when Broncos country, they were making a lot of mock drafts and we needed wide receivers that offseason. Of course, we know the, the team actually ended up taking two wide receivers back to back in the first two rounds. But every other mock draft that you would read on Twitter back in that time had Justin Jefferson in the fourth round because the mock draft machines had Justin Jefferson as like, you know, the 125th best player in the class or something like that. And so every fourth round would come around. And you'd be like, yeah, I like I like Justin Jefferson in the fourth round here. That's a great value. Well, guess what? I mean, he's a first round player and every NFL team saw it. So it's like, what are we why are we putting so much stock into, you know, even as with all due respect to the work they do? I mean, you know, Daniel Jeremiah, he's well connected, pro football focused. They do a lot of work. Mel Kuyper Jr., all these NFL draft experts we base a lot of times our opinions of these quarterbacks based on where they rank on these guys lists. And I don't think that's fair to these quarterbacks and it's not the way that NFL teams roll. No. And and look, I think if there's one thing that we've learned about Sean Payton and the Broncos this off season specifically is they're not really interested in where people think that they should go. Right. Remember Sean sat down with Kay Adams at Super Bowl radio row and said that we're not really getting ourselves on the NFL bus or the NFL van. And, you know, we're not too concerned, like, where people think we should go. He said, if we love a guy, we're going to take that guy, regardless of what other people think. And I think that's how things kind of differentiate here about where maybe the Broncos process is, because you and I have had this conversation. I think when we do mock drafts, and I think I think it's a fun exercise, right? But I think it also gets to the point where it gets a little too serious. And then it creates these unrealistic expectations because the guy that they got in round one or round two is not there. And all of a sudden, like in the real draft, they're like, oh, why is this guy falling? It's like, well, you can't really base that based on where the mock draft simulators were at. These teams build in their they build their own mock draft simulators. They don't go and use like pro football networks. They don't use some of the other mock draft simulators out there. They have a, their own database that they build based on the information that they have. And so they conduct 
very, very thorough background reports on these players. And I think another point that needs to be made here, like Denver, we all know, needs a quarterback. But I think there's a consensus that, well, Denver's not in the top five in terms of picks. That means that they're not going to get a quarterback that's really good. You have to understand, folks, like everyone thinks that Caleb Williams is the top quarterback in this year's NFL draft. And that very well may be the case. But the Broncos may not have him as the number one quarterback on their board. They may have different backgrounds. And I also think you have to factor in when Sean, when George, when the scouts, they all sit down and they're talking about these players in draft meetings and they're looking at everything from on field, off field, just everything that you can imagine. How do they fit inside the offense? If that's the case, you have to formulate and understand that their board may be different because they may think like, hey, because we're picking 12th, we don't think that we're going to get this guy. So we're setting our expectations on our board that, hey, these are players we feel like will be available in the range of where we're at. And then maybe we can trade up, but we don't think that guy's going to be there a little bit later. We see it every year, the consensus. Well, this guy's going to be a round two guy, then ends up going round one. Or this guy's a round one guy, ends up falling to round three. Like, we really do not know until the draft happens. I think that's why we get so worked up. Like, the conversation on draft and what Denver should do gets so toxic on social media because they're like, well, this guy's not going to be there. We don't know yet. And I think that is the ultimate message here when we talk about it. So, Sarah, in my firm opinion, my stance on this, Denver taking a quarterback at 12th overall is not a reach in my opinion. And I don't know where that originally came from because there are some teams ahead of Denver that made moves in NFL free agency at the QB position. Obviously, everybody's going to monitor what the Minnesota Vikings are doing because they acquired that additional first round pick. They have Sam Darnold on one year there. But there are some teams that already made some of their quarterback moves ahead of time. And we don't know who the best fit is for Denver. But I think that is probably something we should talk about for Denver going forward is Sean is going to identify who he thinks can run his offense and elevate everybody else around him. He is. And, and so there's a couple things, right? I mean, obviously, it's not necessarily just going to be a reach if the Broncos take a quarterback at number 12 overall, just based on the consensus. But it's also not going to be settling like there's there's nuance to this discussion. Of course, you could point to any number of draft classes and we're going to get into some of the history of like, you know, situations like the Broncos are facing where teams have been desperate to go after the quarterback position. But Cody, remind me, I mean, how many quarterbacks went before Dak Prescott in 2016? How many quarterbacks went before Patrick Mahomes in 2017? I mean, every single year, NFL teams get it wrong every single year, even if you do, even if the the draft follows the exact consensus order, teams get it wrong all the time. Mm -hmm. How many quarterbacks went before Lamar Jackson? So uh, what I'm saying here is the fact is like Broncos country, stop thinking that, man, we're not going to get a good quarterback because we're picking at number 12 or, or if we have to get the fourth or fifth best quarterback in the draft, that he's not going to be a good player. I don't think that's the case. And, and there's, there's a huge difference between just taking a quarterback, just to take them and liking a number of different court. Maybe you, maybe the Broncos actually, I mean, this is a novel idea. Maybe they like multiple quarterbacks in this class. And that's why we haven't seen them go after, you know, a veteran option, a stopgap option. Maybe that's why we haven't seen them make any desperate trade like the Vikings did to go up and get a specific guy. Maybe they like a variety of players in this draft. And I think that's something that with this coaching staff, like you mentioned, Cody, I think Broncos country can feel confident in. And I feel like there is room here. And, and I trust, like I have trust in what Sean and George and the scouts are going to be able to do in this situation. Though, I think we can all agree, quarterback is going to be the biggest decision that they make. And this will define their time with the Denver Broncos, specifically in this NFL draft, if that is the path that they choose to go. But we got to take a look at some history around the NFL. Quarterback classes, which players worked out, which ones didn't. We're going to take a look at the 2012 NFL draft, the 2021 NFL draft, and the 2018 NFL draft. We're going to go through the list of players, situations, and fits, and we're going to see how these arguments maybe come around full circle and they kind of fall to the wayside. We'll break it all down here on today's brand new episode, Locked on Broncos. This show is sponsored by BetterHelp, and one thing we all want in life is more time to enjoy the things that we have going on in our lives, the things that bring me joy. Like, for example, I love doing this podcast every single day. While this is part of my job, I really enjoy it. But there have been times where I haven't been my best self and I've suffered with stress, I've suffered with anxiety, depression, and I didn't have all the answers. And so it made doing this something that I enjoy very difficult at times. And that's where BetterHelp came in and helped me. BetterHelp Therapy 
is something that I found very beneficial in the time that I used it. I filled out a brief survey. I got matched to a licensed therapist within minutes, and then I scheduled my first session, had a great first session with my therapist, vibed really well with her, and I stuck with her. But if you run into a situation where you get matched with a therapist and you don't vibe well with them, you can switch therapists at any time at no additional charge. So if you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online. It's designed to be convenient, flexible, and best of all, suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapists anytime for no additional charge. Learn to make time for what makes you happy with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash locked on today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P.com slash locked on. If you don't learn from history, you might just be doomed to repeat it. Are the Denver Broncos forcing themselves into a situation where they might be embarrassed by another quarterback selection, or are they going to benefit from other teams in front of them maybe making the wrong choices? At this point, we don't know, but we're going to take a trip down memory lane and talk about some really notable quarterback classes in recent NFL history that can maybe give us some insight into the situation the Broncos face here in 2024 and what we think about that. But I want to say thank you to every single one of you that makes Lockdown Broncos your first listen of the day every single day, especially during the offseason where you know things are changing all the time. Broncos adding pieces to the roster, making moves, building things up towards the NFL draft. So stay tuned every single day right here on the Lockdown Podcast Network, your team every day, free and available everywhere that you listen to podcasts. And jump over to YouTube as well. Hit subscribe over at YouTube and get Lockdown Broncos into your YouTube algorithm. Always great to be able to see everybody over there. Cody, as we take this trip down memory lane, let's go back a, a little over 10 years ago a very notable quarterback draft, the 2012 NFL draft. It, it, it's kind of become one of the best in modern history, which may be not saying a lot, but also <laughs> is kind of saying a lot. It's the Andrew Luck draft, right? It's the draft that ultimately landed Peyton Manning in Denver. And, and it's the it's one of the biggest turning points in Broncos history is this particular offseason. So the 2012 NFL draft, the Broncos were in on a quarterback in this particular draft class, but let's go through this list here. I just want to name off some of these names, and I just want to get your reaction to this, Cody. Obviously, Andrew Luck, number one pick, the Washington at the time, they traded the farm to get Robert Griffin III. Ryan Tannehill goes to the Miami Dolphins, and then Brandon Whedon goes in the first round to the Cleveland Browns. The next quarterback off the board was Brock Osweiler to the Broncos in round two. And then in round three, Russell Wilson to the Seahawks, Nick Foles to the Philadelphia Eagles. In round four, Washington doubled up with Kirk Cousins. So as we talk about this, we, we make this the, this <laughs> arguments happen every single day on online, in the comment section, things like that, about the consensus big board. What does that say to you when you see a quarterback class like that and where those guys are drafted? Like, what does that indicate to you uh, in our current context for the Broncos with all these arguments that keep getting had over this consensus big board mentality? Well, when I look at that draft class and I compare it to like some of the classes we see today, like there's, I think, a wider talent pool back then. And the game was so different back then. The game has certainly evolved, especially on the offensive side. I mean, back then, I feel like the pocket passer was probably the more prominent thing. Now, look, RG3 went healthy. Man, was he a dual threat, the ability to throw, the ability to use his legs. I mean, what was it in 2012 as well? You had other guys around the league that were very dynamic. Colin Kaepernick at the time, like that was something that teams didn't know how to stop the running quarterback. And so the game has really evolved to dual threat, guys who can stand in the pocket, guys who can get outside the pocket, use their legs. And Lamar Jackson, I think, is probably the overall best example of that. In today's game, you can make an argument about Josh Allen. I think Patrick Mahomes, he doesn't have the fastest speed, but Mandis, can he rip off a 25-yard run on you on third and 15 and all of a sudden make you look silly? It's so different, I feel like, in today's quarterback classes because I think a lot of the college offenses are also changing, and you see more high-octane scoring, but you're seeing more balanced defense here at the NFL level, and I think there's an adjustment period. I also feel like when you look at those quarterbacks, I remember the hashtag suck for luck. That was trending on Twitter. That was the most popular thing that people were talking about that year. I, I feel like overall consensus going into it, like we can look now at these guys like RG3, fantastic pick for Washington. Unfortunately, we all know the injuries derailed his entire career. Andrew Luck, borderline, I think, Hall of Fame career. 
And then obviously injuries impacted him, forced him to retire. You look at Ryan Tannehill. He was awful in Miami. And that pan, it, he really resurrected his career with the Tennessee Titans. And that was really it for him. Brandon Whedon, another quarterback in the Cleveland Browns cemetery, similar to where the Broncos are. Brock Osweiler had every opportunity to really be the guy. And to this day, even said that he regrets not, like not picking up John Elway's phone call after the fact because he was burnt about you know Peyton Manning coming back. But Denver won a Super Bowl. That Brock won a Super Bowl out of that. He got paid, but I think he's acknowledged that he regrets that because he would have liked to stay in Denver. Who knows how that would have panned out? Maybe we don't know yet. Russell Wilson, we obviously know his story beating out Matt Flynn. Nick Foles was able to lead the Philadelphia Eagles to a Super Bowl. Very historic there. Kirk Cousins, one of the highest paid quarterbacks in NFL history from an overall value standpoint. Very efficient and super efficient last year before tearing his Achilles. They're good quarterbacks, right? But also I look at the situations those guys went into for the most part, pretty good. I think Ryan Tannehill didn't have a great situation in the Miami, you know, in Miami. I don't think Brandon Whedon had a great situation. Brock came in to learn under Peyton Manning. What better situation do you have there? I think that's probably the more underlying thing here is that all these guys, for the most part, came into really, really good situations, good environments, great coaching staffs. Yeah, they did. And so situation really matters, right? I mean, that's the that's one of the main things that I'm taking from this is that situation matters. And, and you could go to a number of other draft classes with very similar examples of that. 2018, Baker Mayfield, Sam Darnold, Josh Allen, Josh Rosen, Lamar Jackson, Mason Rudolph. Like there was a lot of people that had Mason Rudolph graded above Lamar Jackson in that class, Cody. 2021, Trevor Lawrence, Zach Wilson, Trey Lance, Justin Fields, Mac Jones. This is supposed to be the 2021 draft was supposed to be the one that, man, if you need a quarterback, like you can't miss in the first round. You got to go up and get somebody because these guys are all like, oh, Trevor Lawrence, he's the the second coming of Andrew Luck. And, you know, Zach Wilson, he's like got Mahomes qualities. And Trey Lance, he's like one of the best dual threats to come along. Same with Justin Fields and Mac Jones. He might be a game manager, but he's going to win a lot of NFL. Where are all these guys today? They've all been traded. So I, I think it's all about situation. Like, you look at the Kirk Cousins thing with Washington and the fact that he gets with one of the best coaching staffs in the game and then opportunity. He just, he sees the opportunity. And I remember when Kirk Cousins was a young player, Cody, I remember watching some Washington games and thinking to myself, like, man, that guy was a fourth round pick for a reason. Like he stinks. And he turned things around. He developed go figure yes. in a system with coaches that are really, really good coaches. The same could be said for a lot of these different guys. And it's not necessarily about finding diamonds in the rough. It's about getting the right guy with the right mentality in the right fit. It doesn't matter where you select him in the draft. The Ravens traded up into the first. Nobody was going to take Lamar. The Ravens just said, you know what? Let's get the fifth year option on the guy and get the was a 32nd pick in that class. And they just said, you know what? Screw it. We're going to trade up for Lamar and take a shot. And he's been a multiple time MVP. He was the fifth quarterback taken in that particular class. So it's just it's insanity to think that you can't get the right guy because they're the fourth or fifth quarterback off the board. Now, would it be nice to have the number one pick two years in a row like the Bears and get a mulligan on getting the whatever quarterback you do want? Yes, but sometimes you might get teams in front of you that make the, the wrong decision for you. Case in point, just last year, the Panthers. They trade up with the Bears. They're like, all right, we got all this time. Let's make the let's make the most educated decision possible. Let's go meet with these quarterbacks. Let's go watch them work out. Let's do this, X, Y, Z. They take Bryce Young over C.J. Stroud, and what happened? We all saw it last year. So all I'm saying is, like, Broncos country, let's get – let's. Let's start thinking in terms of, man, maybe the guy that Broncos take, if they take a QB at 12, maybe, just maybe, he might end up being the right fit. Yeah, well, and you look at uh, you know the 2021 class as well. You mentioned, obviously, Trevor Lawrence, Mac Jones. Now they're both on the same team. Mac is the backup now to Trevor Lawrence. So there's a lot of interesting pieces kind of in motion here for that class. And I think there's so much that you and I talk about. It. There's a specific word, and Broncos country might know where I'm going with it. Got to have conviction. If Sean Payton has conviction, that gives the Broncos the authority to make the move that they feel like is best for them. We're going to dive deep into that and talk about what that conviction looks like here on today's brand new episode, Locked on Broncos. Today's Locked on Broncos podcast is brought to you by our friends over there at FanDuel Sportsbook. And folks, as you know, FanDuel is America's number one sportsbook. We're in the month of March, and you know it is a mad time, especially for college hoops. Say goodbye to busted brackets because FanDuel lets you bet on every game of the tourney, whether you're betting on a big upset or you're betting on a one seed, it's time to go dancing on America's number one sports book. 
Right now, new customers get $200 in bonus bets if your first $5 bet wins. So you sign up as a brand new customer, you place a $5 bet, it wins, bam, you get 200 bucks in bonus bets and you can use that $200 in bonus bets to use on point spreads, money lines. You can even do live same game parlays. You can get it on the action and predict how it's going to go or you can maybe even put your money on a potential comeback in one of the games there. Just visit FanDuel.com slash locked on. Once again, that's FanDuel.com slash locked on and bet on college hoops until they cut down the nets. Conviction is one of the more important things that NFL franchises have to have when they make a decision about a player they feel passionate about. And if you don't have conviction, then you can't really necessarily take that risk here. But all signs point to the Broncos coaching staff, the front office. They have a lot of conviction within themselves to make the right decision. And it's going to be the most important decision that Sean Payton and George Payton are going to make here for the Broncos if they do, in fact, go quarterback in the 2024 NFL Draft. Thank you so much, Broncos Country, for tuning in, making us your first listen of the day every single day. Just a reminder, you can get this podcast for free on YouTube or wherever you get your podcast. Sarah, kind of going back to our conversation about all these quarterbacks, where things are at, I, I think so much, and, and we talked about groupthink a little bit earlier, there's a lot of groupthink going on on Twitter. There's a lot of, well, if the Broncos do this, then it's going to be a bad draft. If they do this, it's going to be a good draft. Like, I would be very worried if Denver, if the Broncos, George Payton, Sean Payton, they're sitting here and they're scrolling through Twitter and like, you know what? I wonder what John 555579 says about what we should do in the draft. Or I wonder what Cody Rourke or Sarah Bettinger think we should do in the NFL draft. We should probably do what they want us to do, right? I would be concerned if that was the approach that they took, right? And that's not how they operate. And I, I feel like that's where a lot of the conversation becomes divisive because, look, I, I fans gravitate. They love one player. They may love another player, right? But then it's like, well, if you don't love that player, well, then your opinion doesn't matter. Like, folks, that's the good thing about social media. We can agree to disagree, but we always got to keep it respectful. And I think that's where maybe the draft conversation has gotten a little tiresome overall. But I think at the end of the day, the one thing we need to see for the Broncos and for George Payton, for Sean Payton, conviction. That's the only thing that matters. And if they're convicted about one guy, then I think that they got to take that chance. And I think that's where Broncos country, you know, kind of along, I guess it's kind of ironic, Cody, not talking about groupthink, but I mean, kind of getting on board with the idea that like, Hey, if Sean Payton says that I like this quarterback, like that should be good enough for, uh, for all of us to kind of be like, all right, well, let's see what happens. Because remember there's uh, once upon a time, Sean Payton lured Tony Romo to the Dallas Cowboys as an undrafted free agent. And he was so convicted about Tony Romo that Romo was his number one option when he went to New Orleans to become a head coach as opposed to Drew Brees. And so just think about that. Uh, an organization that you're looking to turn them around. Sean Payton was going to bring on an unknown former undrafted quarterback as his potential starter. That's maybe why we shouldn't be like surprised that he likes Jarrett Sidham enough to roll him out week one because he was going to do the same thing before kind of stumbling into Bill Parcells being like, no, you're not taking Tony Romo. And so Sean Payton pivots and the pivot ended up being Drew Brees. So let's think about that for a second. If maybe the Broncos were going down a Sam Darnold road this offseason and they're thinking, well, let's let's give Sam Darnold a shot. Let's see what the price is at the very least. Now you've had to pivot off that because Sam Darnold goes to the Minnesota Vikings. Maybe your pivot from that is going to be a lot better of an option. Maybe you're going to be able to assemble a much more enticing quarterback room, even to the fan base. But I just think about those types of things, Cody. I think about the, the word conviction that you keep using. And, and I think that's so important. It's like, if Peyton is so convicted about a guy that there's there's a a few decades of trustworthiness to be able to say, OK, you know, he was right about Tony Romo. He was right about Drew Brees. He was right about Jamison and Teddy Bridgewater and all these other guys. Maybe he'll be right about this next one. Well, that's the hope, too. And I, I feel like I need to go on a rant here about something because I also feel like this is a huge issue that we see. And I think we've said this a couple of times. I think quarterback evaluation has been absolutely ruined. And I saw, I was watching the Rich Eisen show the other day, and I thought he had a really great topic of discussion where you look at guys like, I think so many people forget Patrick Mahomes sat behind Alex Smith for a year, right? I think the idea is that, oh, Patrick Mahomes, he came in as a rookie and just lit it up. Like essentially like his real rookie season where he actually got playing time was, you know, his second year in the league. And of course he lit it up 110%. 
but he also got to sit in a situation where they had a really great head coach had a great offensive system and they had a great quarterback in Alex Smith who wasn't like this prolific guy with his arm or legs but he was a guy who could manage the game effectively and then now you bring in a guy who's got okay potential superstar traits a cannon arm the ability to elude you know pressure and get outside switch and kind of be ambidextrous toss left-handed passes against Von Miller while he's bearing down on him and all of a sudden it's like oh my gosh like Denver needs a quarterback like that every team in the NFL would love a quarterback like Patrick Mahomes but I also feel like because of how he performed in his really like his second season in the NFL, his real rookie season, essentially, I feel like that has skewed and has really made the idea on how we evaluate quarterbacks very, very difficult. And I also think it's impacted how teams do it because I think teams are facing the pressure crunch of like coaches needing to win organizations that haven't won in a while needing to win. And it's like, well, if you don't get a guy that can lead you to that right away, then there's no point of taking a guy. And that, in my opinion, I feel like has ruined quarterback development in the national football league. I think it's a huge issue. I do too, Cody. And I, and to your point, like I think that the presence of Patrick Mahomes, especially being in the Broncos division, like not only should we not be grading, grading other quarterbacks on the Patrick Mahomes curve, but at the same time, like the Broncos, you're almost playing with house money in a little bit. I, I think it was the bills GM who recently said something about like, uh, I don't remember what player or position he was even talking about, but basically he was like, you know, if it works out, um, it, it's going to be great for the whole organization, including me. If it doesn't work out, I'm not going to be here to face the music. So I essentially like not to be apathetic towards it or to be flippant about it, but maybe the Broncos should kind of view it as like, we're playing with house money. Like let's, let's assume Pat Mahomes at, at the very least has, you know, six to eight, if not more years in his NFL career, maybe he'll want to shut it down at 30 or something like Aaron Donald or 30, whatever Aaron Donald that maybe Patrick, I would consider that. Honestly, you've done all you, you need. So maybe consider <laughs> shutting it down in a couple of years here and go enjoy your family. But let's, let's be realistic. Like he's going to be around for a long time. Why would the Broncos not take a shot? Like if they, if they say like, look, we think we can make this guy something in a couple of years here, or, or maybe he could even be, uh, he, maybe he, he could even exceed expectations in year one. Like you're going up against Patrick Mahomes twice a year, every year you're in Patrick Mahomes division. Why would you not take a, a shot? The risk reward of that is like, it, it's such a, it's such an odd hill to die on to me to say, well, no, we can't, this will set the organization back X amount of years. And it's like, at this point, who cares? Like, I, I mean, I, I want the Broncos to be good as much as anybody. You and I both do, Cody. It's much more fun to cover a good NFL team. But, like, who really care? Who cares if this quarterback pick doesn't work out? Teams are willing to move on from guys after one to two years of the investment, and they can't. And that's realistic. Like, you could trade whoever you draft this year in two years. It's proven. You could trade them for a fourth or sixth round pick. And you can reset. You could start over. Use your first round. If your quarterback stinks, you're probably going to be picking high in the draft. You play in Patrick Mahomes' division. Why would you not take the shot? It's it's almost insane to me to think that you wouldn't want to do this just because of the risk of, well, it could set the franchise back. It's like the franchise is set back eight years. And you've got Mahomes of the Chiefs. They've won three Super Bowls. The franchise is set back. So take the risk on the quarterback. Well, and on top of that as well, I think one of the other things we have to factor in, Sean Payton only has four years left on his contract. And, you know, he's not going to sit by, waste a year and say, okay, well, I hope next year's quarterback class gives us a position, you know, gives us a, you know, opportunity to get the guy that we want. Sean doesn't even know these guys' names next year, right? So he's focused on this year's class. And I think that's something that we have to really kind of factor into the conversation here. And look, Broncos country, it is a fiery one. It's a passionate one. Let us know how you feel about today's episode. Lockdown Broncos. But that'll wrap up today's episode of the show here on the Lockdown Podcast Network. You can get Lockdown Broncos for free on YouTube or wherever you get your podcast. But one thing is for certain, we'll be back on Monday for a brand new episode of the show. The buildup continues. Broncos country. We'll see you then.